Assalamu alaikum students and we are continuing on with our ophthalmology clerkship video sessions. Today we'll be talking up about optic neuritis which is our second differential in the theme of sudden painless loss of vision. We will be talking about the anatomy of the optic nerve, the definition of optic neuritis, the types of optic neuritis, how do the patients present, the management of patients and finally we'll talk about optic atrophy and papilledema. Optic atrophy, is, uh, optic atrophy is something that can occur as a result of, uh, as a sequelae of optic neuritis, and papilledema is an important uh, differential diagnosis. Um, so we'll start off with the, uh, the, with the overview of the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve. It starts from the optic nerve head and it ends at the optic chiasm. It is divided into four anatomical divisions, an intraocular part, which is basically the uh, optic nerve head or the optic disc. Then it has an intraorbital part, which is the part of the optic nerve in the orbit, an intracanalicular part, which is the part of the optic nerve as it exits the orbit into the cranial cavity, and then the intracranial part. This diagram or picture shows the association of the optic nerve as it passes through the optic canal with the annulus of Zinn. Annulus of Zinn is a fibrous structure which serves as the origin for most of your extraocular muscles. Um, we'll see this little video and the purpose of seeing the video is again to see the association of the nerve with the origin of extraocular muscles and the annulus of Zinn. So as you can see, as the nerve passes through the optic canal, it is surrounded by the origin of the uh, extraocular muscles uh, through, uh, from the fibrous uh, band, which is the annulus of Zinn. If I can stop the video here. So this is that fibrous annulus of Zinn. This is the optic nerve passing through the optic canal. And these are the extraocular muscles that take their origin from this fibrous band. Uh, and you can see that the nerve is in very close association with the origin of muscles. Why is this important? It'll just come up when we discuss the various types of optic neuritis. Um, we'll start off uh, by looking at the structure of the optic disc, uh, which is the beginning of the, or the start of the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve. It is also known as the optic nerve head or the optic papilla. And we have looked at this this very slide before when we were talking about uh, open angle glaucoma. So we'll just review uh, again. The optic disc has a margin, which is the boundary between the retina and the optic disc. It has a central cup, which has no neural tissue, just glial tissue, astrocytes. Uh, and it is basically the structure through which the central retinal vessels either exit or enter the eye. The neural tissue is contained in the rim of the optic disc, and they're basically axons of ganglion cells. And these axons of ganglion cells, they are sort of able to um, uh, transmit uh, the, the glow of the blood vessels that supply uh, the neural tissue within the optic disc, and that's why it has this uh, pinkish uh, hue uh, and and uh, it gives it its characteristic color and it stands out from the cup of the optic disc which appears white because it's full of glial tissue. It has no neural elements. The cup has no neural elements. All of the neural elements are located in the rim. So what is optic neuritis? Optic neuritis is inflammation of the optic nerve. It is something that mostly affects younger individuals between 20 and 45 years of age and mostly females uh, in a ratio of three to two. So about 66% of your patients uh, are going to be female. Uh, it is classified into three different types, papillitis, retrobulbar optic neuritis, and neuroretinitis. Papillitis is the inflammation of the optic nerve head or the optic disc. Retrobulbar optic neuritis is the inflammation of the part of the optic nerve behind the optic nerve head. And neuroretinitis is the inflammation of the optic disc together with the adjacent retina. So what causes optic neuritis? Optic neuritis is largely because of non-infectious etiology of which multiple sclerosis is the number one association. Uh, and it, which is multiple sclerosis by itself is a demyelinating disorder and it causes a demyelinating optic neuritis. Our focus today is going to be on demyelinating optic neuritis. 
The other autoimmune cause is sarcoidosis. There are certain infectious causes like uh, herpes virus, but they are in the minority. By far, the most common association and the most common cause is a demyelinating disorder uh, of which multiple sclerosis would be at the top of the list. So we will talk about demyelinating disorder. We'll talk about its epidemiology, its pathogenesis, and its presentation. So it is, again, 66% of your patients are female, again, between 20 and 45 years of age. So as you can see, the entire optic neuritis uh, epi uh, that we did when we, when we were discussing optic neuritis, its definition, specifically, we talked about certain statistics uh, which, in which we described the age group as well as the gender bias. And it is true for demyelinating optic neuritis as well because the majority of your patients that have optic neuritis actually have the demyelinating type. So most of the statistics that you have are skewed towards the demyelinating optic neuritis. Um, and 75% of the patients who have optic neuritis either have multiple sclerosis or they go on to develop multiple sclerosis. In fact, my optic neuritis may be the first manifestation of multiple sclerosis. And if it is treated with oral steroids, and we'll come back to that again when we talk about its management, if you treat optic neuritis, demyelinating optic neuritis with oral steroids, the disease tends to recur, uh, which can be more detrimental to the vision because it results in more damage to the optic nerve. Uh, when we talk about the Asian subcontinent, we get a lot more isolated optic neuritis as compared to optic neuritis in association with uh, multiple sclerosis, and that is mostly thought to be down to uh, the investigative ability of these nations. And this is in comparison to Northern, North American continent or Western Europe. And it is not that there is a skew. It is thought that perhaps the testing or the investigation is not as thorough and that is why we see a lot of lot more of isolated optic neuritis as compared to optic neuritis in association with multiple sclerosis. So what happens? Basically, the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis and optic neuritis is somewhat similar. Both of them are demyelinating disorders. And what happens is it's an immune-mediated inflammatory demyelination of the optic nerve, specifically the axons of ganglion cells. Remember, it is the axons of ganglion cells which exit the eye through the rim of the optic nerve and they continue on all the way till the lateral geniculate body. So it is the destruction of the myelin sheath around these uh, axons of ganglion cells, which causes poor conduction of neural impulses, uh, which basically results in most of the symptoms and eventually uh, the visual loss that the patient experiences. Uh, Consequently, together with the loss of myelin, you also start getting damage to the neurons themselves, the axons of ganglion cells. And there are two patterns that are seen uh, with regards to where the damage occurs. You can have the damage that is localized to the optic nerve head or the optic disc, which is called papillitis. Uh, you can also have damage to the retrobulbar part of the optic nerve, which is called retrobulbar optic neuritis, in which the inflammation in neural loss occurs behind the optic disc. And the most and the majority of the patients do get the retrobulbar type as, as compared to the papillitis type. Um, and once you have the damage uh, and the neural tissue is lost, its place is taken by glial tissue from the cuff. And we talked about this when we were talking about glaucoma as to how the neural tissue is lost in a very specific pattern and the cup started expanding. Well, the neural tissue is getting damaged here, and again, it's the glial tissue or gliosis from uh, within the, if, if it is papillitis, within the optic nerve that would sort of expand. So the, the mechanism of, of the gliosis is similar in the sense that neural tissue is lost and glial tissue is taking its place. But the reasons for damage are very different. In glaucoma, it is thought that it is either ischemia or mechanical compression on the axons of the ganglion cell. In demyelinating optic neuritis, it is obviously an immune-mediated loss of the myelin sheath together with damage to the axon themselves. And this would eventually result in optic atrophy because you would lose neural tissue within the optic nerve. The same process 
of gliosis and loss of myelin sheath and neural tissue is also happening everywhere else in the central nervous system in multiple sclerosis. That is why the term sclerosis, because you get those gliosis or areas of thickening wherever you start getting a neural loss. So multiple sclerosis and optic neuritis have the same uh, pathogenesis that there is neural loss followed by gliosis. If it is occurring within the optic nerve head, it is called papillitis. If it's occurring in the part of the optic nerve behind the optic nerve head or the optic disc, remember optic nerve head, optic disc, and optic papilla are all the same thing, different names for the same thing. If it's happening behind the optic disc, it's called retrobulbar optic neuritis. And the same process anywhere else in the central nervous system is termed as multiple sclerosis. So how do the patients present? Well, if you're getting loss to the nerve that is taking all the impulses back to the visual cortex, uh, the optic nerve, which is the afferent nerve, you are going to get some form of visual loss. And this visual loss is sudden and painless, generally painless. We'll talk about why I'm using the word generally. And it develops in hours. Usually the PL can be, uh, the visual acuity can be as worse as light perception, but it can vary. And the visual acuity in most patients tends to, tends to improve even back to even being normal uh, after about two weeks. Uh, but there are some patients who experience permanent visual loss and experience no visual improvement at all. Uh, an RAPD is always present in a unilateral acute attack. It is also present in a bilateral asymmetric attack. Uh, you can learn more about RAPD. I'm sure you've already done the pupillary examination. Uh, we have a skill video on that, so you can refer to the skill video if you'd like to know or review what you already know about a relative afferent pupillary defect. Uh, the other two things that are associated with optic neuritis are red desaturation. Uh, you get red desaturation simply because once the neural conduction sort of slows down, uh, the red cones are the ones that are most prominent and the red signal is the one that is uh, most suppressed in the sense that it was the most common cone and now all that signal uh, for the red color that was reaching the, the visual cortex is not getting there. So everything red appears slightly pinkish. Uh, the other thing together with red, uh, red desaturation is pain. Uh, we talked about this being a generally painless condition, but some individuals do experience this really vague pain. And that is experienced in the retrobulbar type, not in the papillitis type. And uh, I would like you to think uh, why that is. And I'm sure you, if you do think you'd be able to get to the reason simply because we've talked about it, and that is because of this. You have the optic nerve passing through the optic canal in very close association with the annulus of Zinn, the fibrous band, which serves as the origin of extraocular muscles. So it is in very close association with these uh, extraocular muscles. And as the nerve is inflamed, it gets even closer to these muscles. And when the muscle contracts, it touches the nerve, which, which, which produces the sensation of pain. So that is why these individuals complain of this really vague pain together with the symptoms. Otherwise, in, in papillitis, and most patients would sort of not even uh, complain of pain in, uh, uh, because the visual loss is so significant to them. And that is the most important thing that they remember uh, about their presentation and not the pain. So pain is not something that's definite. Don't think that unless you have pain, you don't have optic neuritis, that's not true. Some patients do complain of a very vague sensation. Uh, so we, you have to keep that in mind. But, but generally patients might just be complaining of sudden painless loss of vision. This is red desaturation. We have looked at this picture before when we were talking about cellulitis. So red, as shown in the right uh, side of the picture, appears as pink as shown on the left side of the picture, if you're experiencing uh, demyelinating optic neuritis. This is the appearance of the optic nerve head or the optic disc in a patient who suffers from papillitis. And there are a couple of things that you note here. A, you can't really make out the margin of the optic disc. B, you can't make out the cuff. And even the rim seems to be more red or more congested. And that is essentially all of the features of inflammation that you are seeing here. Uh, so the indistinct margin is because of the inflammatory exudate covering the margin. The cup is missing for the same reason because the inflammatory exudate has sort of obscured the cup. And the rim is congested because of 
you know, inflammation causes vasodilation, which causes congestion. Um, this is a comparison of the normal optic disc uh, as shown on the left to an optic disc uh, that is suffering from papillitis, uh, which is shown on the right, uh, indistinct margins, rim congested, and a cup not visible. So this is the presentation of a patient suffering from demyelinating optic neuritis has the same uh, set of uh, symptomatology, sudden painless loss of vision with an RAPD in this right eye. But when you look at the fundus, you don't really see anything that's out of place. So this is the picture of the optic disc, uh, which is magnified. This is a picture of the posterior pole and the picture of the optic disc is magnified on to the left side. Uh, and if you look at it, you see a very distinct margin. You see a cup, uh, which is right here, and you see a rim. Uh, the rim is pink in color, so it, it sort of appears slightly less pink because of the way the, the picture is taken, but it is of a normal color and a normal appearance. So why is the patient experiencing symptoms of optic neuritis? The hint here is that the patient also complains, has complaints of that vague pain, and that is happening because this is the retrobulbar type of optic neuritis, because the inflammation is all behind the optic nerve head or the optic disc, so the optic disc appears normal. And to get or to diagnose or to see this, you need to do an MRI. Uh, when you want to investigate optic neuritis and you are investigating for retrobulbar optic neuritis, the type of MRI you do is one with fat suppression and gadolinum, gadolinium. Uh, and what you see is enhancement of the optic nerve that tells you that the nerve is inflamed. If you're trying, if you're doing MRI for multiple sclerosis, you do something called FLARE, Fluid Attenuated Inversion Recovery. And what that does, it is suppresses the effects of CSF on MRI imaging. And so the periventricular area where you first start seeing the, the demyelination and gliosis, those appear as, as highly contrasting, hyperintense uh, lesions. I'll show you some pictures. Um, and the other thing that you can do for CSF analysis, again, for diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and not for optic neuritis, is the IgG index, which is the comparison of CSF IgG to serum IgG, and it is raised. So this is a MRI uh, for retrobulbar optic neuritis, and you can see in hyperintense enhanced optic nerve right here. So this is for retrobulbar optic neuritis. And for associating retrobulbar optic neuritis with multiple sclerosis, you would obviously have symptoms of optic neuritis, but you will also have symptoms of maybe the effect of multiple sclerosis on other areas of the central nervous system. So if you have a patient who is a diagnosed case of multiple sclerosis and is presenting with optic neuritis, he might have one of these symptoms, or he might not be even a diagnosed case of multiple sclerosis and is presenting with optic neuritis with a history of one of these symptoms. So you can sort of link these two things together and come up with a diagnosis that, oh, you have multiple sclerosis of which one of the presentations is optic neuritis. So you can have issues with any part of your nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, the sensory, the motor, and even the psychomotor nervous system. Um, so if you have an issue with the autonomic nervous system, you would have bowel and bladder dysfunction. For sensory nervous system, you have pain, numbness, tingling, those pins and needles sensations, the paresthesias. For motor nervous system, you have muscle weakness. You can also get muscle spasms at time, and you can have difficulty in speech and swallowing. Uh, for your cognitive and, uh, and, and psychological anomalies, the psychological part of the, the central nervous system, you can have decreased attention span, uh, mood instability, depression, excessive fatigue. Uh, so your patients can present with more than one or more than one of the, the symptoms of central nervous system involvement in multiple sclerosis together with optic neuritis. So they may either be diagnosed or they might be coming to you and if they are coming to you, you should be able to associate these central nervous systems to central nervous system symptoms to that of what they are presenting in ophthalmology, i.e., the symptoms of optic neuritis. That is especially true if you are a family physician or a general physician, uh, because you are responsible for the well-being of your patient as a whole. And you should, in addition to referring a patient to an ophthalmologist, 
also refer the patient to a neurologist saying, hey, you know, it is a disease that would require uh, care from multiple, multiple specialities. So this is a picture of the, an MRI of the CNS uh, showing you those uh, periventricular hyperintense lesions. These are the areas where you have uh, the gliosis. And this is, again, a flare, fluid, inver fluid attenuated inversion recovery. You can see that the CSF, uh, uh, the effect of CSF on this image is sort of suppressed so that these lesions stand out more. Uh, there are two signs that are associated with multiple sclerosis and thus optic neuritis in a patient of multiple sclerosis. And one of them is a Lermit sign. Lermit sign is if you flex the neck uh, rather quickly, you have that electrical sensation that runs down your legs, your spine, and your arm. And this is basically demyelination and hyperexcitability that causes this. However, Lermit sign is not something that's specific to multiple sclerosis. You can also see it in some other diseases. So seeing Lermit sign is not a definitive thing that, yeah, this is uh, multiple sclerosis. It's just it is, seen, it is also seen in multiple sclerosis. The other one is called Uthoff's phenomena, which is basically worsening your, of your symptoms of multiple sclerosis, including those of optic neuritis, when the body temperature increases, when you exercise or take a hot water bath. And this happens because as you raise the temperature, the nerve conduction slows down. And again, um, as I said before, this can be seen in a patient of optic neuritis who has had uh, a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis established or even with an unestablished diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Um, so this is something that your patients might also be complaining of. So how do we manage it? Well, um, if you have a patient who has demyelinating optic neuritis, but no evidence of multiple sclerosis uh, on magnetic resonance imaging uh, and no symptoms either, uh, and also maybe also on CSF analysis, the management is IV methylprednisolone one gram per day for three days, then oral prednisolone one milligram per kilogram per day for 11 days with a four day taper. What this does is this will hasten visual recovery but has no effect on the final visual outcome. Uh, so for example, your patient might recover to 6-12 in two weeks with this treatment and that vision would remain 6-12 for the given period of time. Even without treatment, your patient would recover to 6-12, but it would take a little bit more time. If you have demyelinating optic neuritis together with evidence of multiple sclerosis, either based on MRI or CSF analysis or symptomatology that the patient is experiencing, um, you can initiate any one of these treatments, including the one that we already talked about. In addition, interferon and betasterones are something that are also uh, indicated for you. So you don't use all of them, obviously, you just one of these uh, um, treatments, not all four of them at the same time. And what they, these do uh, specifically in a setting of optic neuritis with multiple sclerosis is hasten visual recovery. Um, and oral prednisolone, as I've talked about before, is never prescribed by itself, never prescribed by itself in any case of demyelinating optic neuritis, whether associated uh, with multiple sclerosis or not, because it increases the risk of recurrence of the optic neuritis. So it's never prescribed by itself. It is better to do nothing than to prescribe oral prednisolone. So don't do that. If you don't do anything, the, your patient would recover some vision. With, multiple, with oral steroids, you are condemning your patients to recurrent attack of optic neuritis, so don't prescribe oral steroids by themselves. So what are the outcomes? Um, if you do start treatment uh, with, uh, in a, with, with the intravenous methylprednisolone followed by oral then taper, you can have rapid improvement in vision up to 6-6. Some, as we've talked about, uh, talked about before, some patients show no improvement. And even though your vision might improve to 6-6, to some extent, your color vision and your contrast can remain affected, uh, even though your visual acuity has improved to 6-6. And the only indicator that is uh, present uh, or that is known of how much your vision will recover is how much was the vision affected during the attack of optic neuritis. Recurrence here is possible, but it is less as compared to those patients who have optic neuritis in association with multiple sclerosis. So 
what about the outcomes of optic neuritis, which is in association with multiple sclerosis? Again, patients do improve and can improve up to 6x. Some, again, show no improvement. There is always a little color deficit and contrast deficit that remains, even though your vision recovers to 6x. Uh, the visual, again, the indicator for how much your vision would recover would is dependent upon how severe was the visual loss during the attack. The chances of recurrence here is twice as more as the recurrence in a patient who has optic neuritis without evidence of multiple sclerosis. Again, I put it here, oral prednisolone alone is never prescribed. We will now talk about optic atrophy, and optic atrophy is defined as the death of axons of the ganglion cells that comprise the optic nerve, and that results in pallor, which is visible in the optic disc when you do ophthalmoscopy. Now, the thing to remember here is we are talking about death of axons of ganglion cells, and axons of ganglion cells starts off all the way from the retina in the nerve fiber layer, uh, if you remember from the discussion on glaucoma, and they continue all the way to lateral geniculate body. So this damage to the axon of ganglion cell can occur anywhere from the optic disc, uh, even before the nerve fiber layer, then all the way to the lateral geniculate body, and it would produce a very similar appearance of the, uh, the, the optic disc. Uh, it would become pale. And, and the manifestation in the optic disc is simply because the, nerve, the neuron is the same. Remember, this is the second order neuron. The first order neuron was the bipolar cell. The second order neuron is the ganglion cell. Its axon starts from within the retina and continues all the way to the lateral geniculate body. And thus, you get optic atrophy if you have damage to this pathway, which extends all the way from the retina to the lateral geniculate body. And because it's such a large area, relatively speaking, in comparison to the eye, you can have a lot of causes of optic atrophy some within the retina and the optic nerve like glaucoma. Cupping is an example of optic atrophy. Something which is the inflammation of the optic nerve itself, optic neuritis and compression uh, directly on the optic nerve in form of optic nerve tumors or raised intracranial pressure and compression of the, uh, of, of, the, of, of the passage of axons of ganglion cell within the cranial cavity. So lots of causes, simply because the damage can take place anywhere from the retina all the way to the lateral geniculate body. And in all cases, it is going to be the loss of axons of ganglion cells, which is the neural tissue, and its replacement by glial tissue that leads to the appearance of the optic atrophy. And since the axon can die at any place in this path, it would also manifest in the optic disc simply because it's the optic disc is a place where the axons are actually leaving the eye through the rim of the optic disc to be more appropriate. Uh, so how do these patients present? They're going to pre present with some form of visual loss and varying degrees of visual loss. And that visual loss could be in visual acuity, visual feel, color, contrast. It could be gradual, it could be sudden, it could be with pain, it could be without pain, simply because there's so many causes. We'll talk about some of them. If you have unilateral optic atrophy, you're going to get an RAPD. If you have bilateral asymmetric RA, uh, optic atrophy, you're going to get a relative after and pupillary defect. Uh, some examples, optic neuritis, which is inflammation of the optic nerve, uh, either the optic nerve head or the optic nerve behind the optic nerve head, it will produce a sudden loss of vision with very vague complaints of pain in the retrobulbar type. Open angle glaucoma produces gradual, bil uh, gradual bilateral uh, visual field loss. Um, it could be asymmetric, but it's generally bilateral. In very few cases, for example, certain types of secondary open angle may have unilateral loss. Papal edema, we will talk about papal edema in a little bit of detail, uh, produces a gradual and bilateral uh, loss of vision, visual acuity specifically, uh, in long standing cases of uh, meningeal inflammation. Uh, and your optic disc would have variable appearance of pallor. That amount of pallor or paleness of the optic disc would depend upon how many of the neural elements are lost. And if you have damage to the axons of ganglion cells from optic chiasm onwards, you are going to get the effects of atrophy uh, or the effects of the atrophy will be seen in both eyes because the fibers uh, from one optic nerve cross over to the other at the optic chiasm. Uh, I'm sure you know the crossing over of the fiber at the optic chiasm. So if you have damage to the chiasm or the uh, ganglion, axons of the ga ganglion cells behind the chiasm in the optic tract, the effects would be seen in both the eyes. So optic disc or optic atrophy, sorry, optic atrophy could be classified on the basis of its appearance into four types. 
And by basis of its appearance, I mean when you look at the optic disc during ophthalmoscopy. You could have a primary optic atrophy and the optic disc margin is distinct. And the, the, there is no inflammation, uh, there is no swelling of the optic disc that leads to uh, an atrophy. By swelling, I mean there is no real inflammatory process that occurs uh, that, uh, within the, the pathway that we talked about that uh, causes optic atrophy. So it's a very clean looking optic atrophy with very distinct margins. Uh, one of the examples is shown in picture A. Uh, that's why we have this letter A written next to primary. Then we have a secondary optic atrophy. The secondary optic atrophy occurs when you have some level of swelling at the optic disc. It produces a slightly dirty looking optic atrophy in which you have margins that are indistinct. Papilledema and papillitis are two examples that produce this type of optic atrophy. In both cases, uh, there is swelling or inflammation which would uh, result in a picture like this. Then we have consecutive optic atrophy, and this is one in which there is something wrong with the blood supply. And this is seen in retinitis pigmentosa and vascular occlusion in which you have a waxy disc together with thinned out blood vessels. An example of vascular occlusion is shown. And finally, glaucomatous, which we have talked about in detail, which is visible as cupping. Finally, papilledema. Papilledema, well, before we talk about papilledema, let's just take a look at these two pictures. They are of, from the same patient. One is the right and the other is the left uh, picture of the optic disc. The patient has 6x vision, no color or contrast deficit, and no RAPD. So what does the patient have? If you look at these two pictures, again, the margins are indistinct. You can't see the cup, but the disc have more of an edematous appearance rather than an inflammatory appearance, and this is because of papilledema. Papilledema is raised intracranial pressure, which compresses or chokes the flow of the exoplasm within the optic disc. And because initially it is just choking the flow of exoplasm, there is really no loss of vision or associated visual characteristic like color and contrast uh, in the acute stages of, of the raised intracranial pressure. The raised intracranial pressure can be because of tumors, can be because of meningitis, uh, any cause of uh, raised intracranial pressure really. And it, it is basically, again, as I've said, it chokes optic nerves uh, as, as it is about to enter the eye. It's like somebody pressing your neck and that's exactly what happens. The intracranial pressure chokes the optic nerve right here where it is entering into the eyes to flow the exoplasmic slow down. And since this is an intracranial phenomena, it is going to affect both of your eyes symmetrically. And both of your eyes would have a very similar appearance. And again, because initially it's just the slowing down of the exo exoplasmic flow, the neural conduction pretty much is not affected. So the vision in acute stages is not affected. Loss of vision does occur once this stays around for enough time and that choking action can actually result in loss of neural tissue and gliosis. So again, the disc has this appearance because of uh, the flow of exoplasm has sort of slowed down. And this edema that you see is basically the, the effect of that choking. So this is a comparison between papillitis and papilledema. Sometimes they are very difficult to tell apart, but you can see that the papillitis has more of an inflammatory look and papilledema has more of an edematous look. But at times it can uh, uh, be very, very difficult. And papilledema is bilateral, unless obviously one of your discs has suffered atrophy prior to the event that led to the raise in intracranial pressure. For example, you had a patient who has optic neuritis, led to atrophy of one eye, then developed meningitis because of an infection or something. In, in that case, one of the eyes is already, one of the optic nerves of the eyes already experienced atrophy. And because there are no neural elements, if the atrophy is complete, there is no question of exoplasmic flow being slowed down. So you won't see a bilateral papilledema. Papilledema by definition is bilateral. So you would see a unilateral papilledema if one of the discs is atrophic. This is an example of uh, secondary optic atrophy. You can see the dirty margins. And this is as a consequence of long-standing papilledema. You can see dirty margins, both discs, the left and the right disc are sort of pale, uh, and the margins are indistinct, leading to, which is defining secondary optic atrophy, uh, because the, uh, the discs between the two eyes are so similar in appearance. Uh, if this is 
almost certainly to be uh, as a consequence of papillating this optic atrophy. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you know where to ask, and I'll see you in your next video session.